Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our presentation today, sponsored by the Don Christadelphians. At the outset, I would like to recap some of the beliefs of what we are about. First and foremost, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God, which is totally inspired, and that it contains a message for our salvation. It contains a hope, and we believe our only hope for today. We believe that our hope, that our salvation, includes a kingdom of God to be established on this earth, and that it will be our only hope for today. So for the next few minutes, we are going to discuss what the current situation consists of, and why there is a need for a hope. And then we will show from the Bible how the kingdom of God is our only hope for today. And so what? do we need a hope for? What is happening about us in our country? Let's talk about the social climate. If we look at examples in the Bible, it may make it a little clearer for us. Let's look at Luke chapter 17. Jesus said when he was on earth, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed." You see, there was a lot of wickedness in Noah's time. But Jesus also said that in the days before the flood, the people did eat. They drank, they married wives. Let's look at this for a moment in the context of today. The mention of eating and drinking has real significance for our generation. In North America, we are a nation of heavy eaters. Go into any city and just take note of the number of eating places that you see. Medical stats prove that we eat way too much. In fact, studies in the last few years in the province that I come from, in Ontario, Canada, show that the number of cancer incidences would be reduced by at least 30% if people employed healthy eating habits and exercise. Heart disease, too, would be greatly reduced by a similar amount. The fast food industry is booming. More people eat out today than even prepare food at home for their family. And as far as drinking is concerned, more money is spent on alcohol than on education today. And then Jesus said they married wives. What does that mean? The marrying and given in marriage refers to the looseness which abounds in relation to the marriage vows. Today, in our time, divorce and separation is on the increase. It is alarming that in the past 40 years, divorce has risen from 1 in 40 marriages to 1 in 2 marriages. Sex crimes are sweeping over our communities like a flood. Juvenile delinquency, quite often the result of broken homes, is increasing by leaps and bounds. For example, in the last several years, we can also add terrorist threatening and mass murder. A couple of years ago, it was felt by a number of people that we are called the culture of death. Now, that's not a very good label, is it, for a generation at the end of the greatest technological time we have ever lived in. Yes, I think we would all agree that we are seeing the days of Noah once again, when men's hearts and the earth will be continually filled with violence. Now we are confronted with an age of terrorism that is not isolated, but is an actual fact sweeping this planet. One just has to consider the events surrounding 9-11 to realize that fact. I'm sure we can all remember 
where we were, what we were doing, when those deadly attacks took place. I know for myself, I had just got into the car to go and run an errand. The radio station in Canada, the radio station I was listening to, was running a live feed from the ABC network. At first, when listening to that, one would think the whole country was under attack. Since the Second World War and the attack on Pearl Harbor, has there been anything so devastating? In the name of God, those who practice their religion zealously see it as pleasing God by the act of force. It's in Israel, it's in Africa, it's in the United States and Canada, and it will spread elsewhere. And then we have the current economic situation. In the past six months, never has there been such a falling in the stock market since the great stock market crash of 1929, which ushered in the Great Depression. In the past months, world leaders have gathered together to try and come up with solutions to the current problems, again an unprecedented action. In the May editorial of the Don Christadelphian Ecclesial Magazine, we read that, quote, the group of 20 finance ministers and central bank governors known as the G20 met in London, England in April to discuss the world financial situation. At the end of the summit, it was felt by many that a global crisis requires a global solution. Certainly in their discussions, it became quite apparent that the crisis is the greatest challenge to this world economy in modern times. A crisis that's affecting every single country. Although the difficulty hit the headlines in September of 2008, major problems affecting the world's finances came as no surprise to students of Bible prophecy. It is understandable that the financial crisis will accompany the political turmoil of the latter days leading to the time of trouble such as never was. Isaiah reminds us that prosperity is in the hands of God. He says, quote, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word." Unquote from Isaiah 24. Paul told us to expect the selfish attitudes that have played a part in this crisis. He said that people will become lovers of themselves. They will become lovers of money. The G20 focused attention on the measures which member nations had already, in some cases, been putting in place. Many questioned the wisdom of a larger part of the world attempting to buy their way out of trouble with an international program in which dollars counted in the hundreds of billions and sometimes trillions will suffice to rebuild trust in the world's bank and industries. It is hoped that this will restore prosperity to the former unparalleled prosperity experienced in the last 50 years in this country. The G20 pledged to restore, to repair, to strengthen, to reform, and to overcome. The problem, however, is that a failure in one part of the system quickly affects the rest. As recent events have demonstrated, the power of communication is largely responsible for the globalization of the world of man. Today, the control ruled by finance extends very far indeed. Finance now rivals ideology in its power over world events. Unstable finances have the potential to change the balance of power in 
a region very rapidly. Nowhere is this possibility more likely than in the Middle East, where the presence of the United States currently largely maintains the status quo in a region where the protagonists are moving further apart. In contrast to the time needed to gain support for the ideologies of destruction, finance could either mobilize or freeze the world's forces overnight in a manner that will facilitate the approaching of the battle of that great day of God Almighty alluded to in Revelation. Now, the foregoing was quoted from the editorial in the Don Christadelphian magazine, the May issue 2009. And so, friends, when we consider these things, there is a real need for a solution to what we see, isn't there? There is a real need for a hope to take us from all of this. Let's now look at God's Word, which will clearly outline our only hope for today. I think we would all agree that with the conditions we see in the world about us, there is a real need for us to have a hope of salvation. The age-old question, what must I do to be saved? If we want to be saved from what is about us in the world, then there is a real need for belief, isn't there? And the next question would be, what do we need to believe from God's Word in order to be saved? Then what sort of life should we lead? Frequently asked question amongst people today, what is in it for me? How long am I going to be affected by the future? And what is the prospect for the future? That is what we want to try and accomplish in the next few minutes. There is, however, good news awaiting us. Now, when Jesus was on earth, he did speak of a kingdom, a divine political dominion that would be set up on this earth for the purpose of blessing and bringing the world into subjection to God. He spoke of it, spoke of it in Matthew chapter 9 and uh, 4 first and then 9. In 4 and 23, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Let's also look at Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. As in these two references, friends, it clearly shows that Jesus was preaching the gospel or the good news of what is to take place. In Acts chapter 19, Paul spoke of the kingdom. He said, we read, he went, that's Paul, went into the synagogue, spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading things concerning the kingdom of God. And so it is that kingdom we want to talk about for a few moments. Friends, we maintain that this kingdom will be the solution to the current world problems. In order for this kingdom to be set up and established on this earth, it means, doesn't it, that Jesus will need to return to this earth. We remember, don't we, the words from Acts when he was taken up from them into heaven. And it says, when he, Jesus, had spoken these things, while they beheld, that's the disciples, the people around him, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And so from here then we see that Jesus is to come back to this earth, just as the Bible says, in like manner as they saw him go into heaven. When Jesus returns, what's he going to do? Let's trust the Word of God on this, our only really reliable source. We've already quoted from Acts on how Paul preached the kingdom of God. Let's look at his letter to the Thessalonians for his elaboration on the return of Christ to the earth. We read in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 10, 
for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. And in the next reference, for what is our hope, 1 Thessalonians 2 and 19, for what is our hope, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And then over to uh, chapter 3 and 13, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. And in verse 16 of chapter 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And verse 23 in chapter 5, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so, the Bible clearly tells us, doesn't it, that Jesus is to return to this earth. What, but what's he going to do? What does the Bible say? Let's turn to Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. It says, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 3, And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But what are they going to do? They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all people will walk, every one, in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Yes, friends, those verses sum up completely exactly what we're trying to say, that in the last days, in that day, a very real kingdom, a kingdom on earth that is going to affect people. Verse 2 says that the law will go forth from Zion. This then indicates rulership. Yes, rulership by Christ and his saints, by his associates. Verse 3 indicates he shall judge among many people. Yes, settling disputes. There's a great need for that, isn't there? Verse 3 also indicates there will be an end to war. He says they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Yes, an end to war. Amazing, isn't it? And then verse 4, no more poverty, but fairness. We read that none shall make them afraid, everyone dwelling safely under his vine and under his fig tree. Yes, peacefulness. And then in verse 5, we read, there will be godliness. For all people will walk, everyone in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of our God forever and ever. There are many verses which describe what the kingdom will be like at that time, and the conditions on this earth in the future. Isaiah chapter 35 gives us further insight. He says in verse 4, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. 
The next verse, 21. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame leap, as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. Yes, it will be a time of healing. It will be the best health care system ever in all of the world. Now let's turn to Isaiah 65, which gives us a very thorough picture of that kingdom. We read, For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Verse 20, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. For the child, think of it, the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. Verse 21, and they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord." Yes, these verses indicate a superb length of life. The verses we have just quoted, they demonstrate to us that there will be an end to hunger and famine. Verse 25 suggests there will be changes in the animal kingdom. And over in Isaiah 11, it talks further about the changes, which are very similar to the words from Isaiah 65. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, people will be joined to God. We read from Zechariah chapter 2, And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. Thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. So then when will this take place? When do we expect the kingdom of God to be established on earth? Jesus said when the disciples asked him, Master, when shall these things be? In Luke 21, he said, What shall be the sign of these things that shall come to pass? The next few verses indicate that when there are wars, revolutions, earthquakes, famines, and pestilences. And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. And then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Yes, signs in the suns of the moon and stars, men's heart failing them for fear, looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And friends, it will be at that time that we will see Christ's return, as in Luke 21, when they see the Son of Man coming in power, in a cloud with power and great glory, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Yes, with these events we see about us unfolding, we know that we are in the latter days. Now I want to quote from an article that was written by a Christadelphian, Robert Roberts, in 1862 and was published 
in the May Ecclesial Magazine, the Christadelphian Magazine. And the article was entitled, Coming Troubles and the Second Advent. And he says, Hence, at the first indication of the approach of the end, we must look for times of great trouble and commotion. International politics will become complicated beyond the possibility of unravelment. A universal war spirit will be invoked. Commerce will become embarrassed, trade unfettered, employment precarious. Distrust will fill society, panic will spread. Trade bankruptcies will follow in quick succession, and the social fabric will be shaken to the foundation, if not involved in ruin and reduced to chaos. Events will stride with rapid march, and anon the superhuman will enter the scene. Yes, that really applies to us today, doesn't it? And it gives credence to the words that we quoted from Luke 21, that when ye see these things happen, behold, the Son of Man will return. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. And what about us? How do we get involved? By opening God's word and listening. If we follow His word, if we believe and are baptized as commanded in the Bible, if we are found worthy at Christ's return, our redemption will draw nigh and we will have salvation and we will be saved. That is why we maintain that the kingdom of God is our only hope for today. Thank you very much.